Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste and welcome to this course on Introductory Law for Conservation and Management. I am Dr. Ankur Avadhyaya. I am an IFS officer of the Madhya Pradesh Kader and your instructor for this course. So, this course will be divided into several modules. So, the first module is General Principles of Law and in this course we will have 12 modules each with 3 lectures. And at the end of those 12 modules, we will have a 13th module where we will sum up and discuss about what we have learned throughout this course. So, the first module is the general principles of law, where we have introduction, rights and duties, and crimes and civil wrongs. So, let us begin with introduction. What is conservation? The word conservation comes from two Latin word roots. The first one is con. Con means together. And the word root surveyor means to keep. So, conservation is to keep together. So, you are trying to keep something together. You are trying to conserve something. You are trying to preserve it in a way that it remains for a very long period of time. So, that is conservation. Or we can define conservation as preservation protection and restoration. And generally we say that this preservation, protection and restoration is to be done of the natural environment and wildlife. So, what are these three words? Preservation means that you are going to keep the natural environment and wildlife as they are. So, you are trying to preserve it. Do not do anything to the natural environment and wildlife. So, that is one part of conservation. So, for instance, you will declare certain areas to be national parks and you will say that we are not going to do any timber extraction from this area, we are not going to do any hunting in this area, we are going to ensure that pollutants do not get into this area and also we are going to ensure that other resources such as water are not removed from this area. So, you are trying to preserve these areas as national parks. So, that is the first part of conservation, preservation of certain areas. But not every area has to be preserved. So, some areas that are working fine can be just protected. A good example is our territorial forests. Now, in the case of territorial forests, our approach is to extract timber in a way that is sustainable. That is we are only going to extract that much amount of timber as has grown over the previous period, not anything more. So, that the total amount of timber or the total amount of wood or trees in that forest, they that remains constant. One benefit of that approach is that the forests are always growing because you are removing the older individuals and you are providing space for the new ones to come up. So, in those cases, we are not doing preservation, we are doing just a protection and a sustainable harvesting of resources. Now, even in those forests, protection is required because in cases of things like forest fires or diseases or droughts, you will need to come up with a plan and you will need to execute that plan so that the forests are not destroyed. So, in those cases, we are not doing preservation, but we are doing protection of the natural environment and wildlife. But in certain cases, you can have a situation where the natural environment and wildlife have already been destroyed or disturbed to quite an extent. And in those cases, we will try to restore them. That is, we will try to bring them back to their original condition. So, conservation is preservation, protection and restoration of the natural environment and wildlife. But why do we need to do conservation? 
Well, conservation is required because firstly, forest and wildlife provide us with several benefits. So there are several direct and indirect benefits that we get out of the forest. And if we require those benefits, we will require forest and wildlife to be maintained in a best functioning state. So what are those benefits? We have things like clean air. So the forest remove pollutants from the air. The forest also uh, add to the level of oxygen and uh, remove carbon dioxide from the air through the process of photosynthesis. So forest and providers, uh, forest and wildlife provide us with clean air. Similarly, they provide us with clean water through processes such as bioremediation. They also do stabilization of soil. So basically, if you have an area that does not have forest, that does not have a vegetation cover, then with the next rains or with the winds, the soil will just erode away. So forests provide us with this benefit that they keep the soils stable. They prevent erosion. They also provide us with tourism and peace of mind. They also provide us with opportunities to educate our people, to perform research works and so on. So the first need of doing conservation is to get these benefits. If we do not have forest and wildlife, we will not have these benefits. Now, most of these benefits are the benefits of trees, but these are also the benefits of the wildlife because trees do not exist just by themselves, they exist in an ecosystem. And the wildlife also play a large number of important roles for the preservation and propagation of these trees. For example, if you have a tree, so if you have a tree and if you do not have any wildlife, then the fruits of this tree will just drop down and these, when the young plant comes up, this young plant would be in the shade of the mother tree. And so this young plant will not be able to grow properly. But if you have wildlife here, then the wildlife are going to eat away these fruits and probably disperse the seeds somewhere else. And so the plant that comes up is able to grow properly. So, even if we require the benefits of trees, we will need to conserve wildlife as well. Certain things such as tourism are more and more wildlife driven. So forests and wildlife provide us with certain benefits and if we need these benefits, then we will need to conserve the forests and wildlife. Another need for conservation is that we have already created huge losses for forests and wildlife. And so, if we do not take steps now, it is very much possible that the forest and wildlife will be decimated for all future generations. So, today is the prime time to do conservation because we have already done a lot of harm. And so, if we do not conserve what is left, we will be left with nothing. So, what are the kinds of harms we have done? We have done habitat degradation. Now, degradation is the reduction of quality of a habitat. So, if you have say a pond and this pond is able to support a large variety of uh, organisms, but then if you dump waste materials, if you dump pollutants, if you dump municipal waste into this pond, then the quality will go down. Probably earlier the pond was able to support 5000 fishes, now it is only able to support 2000 fishes. That is an example of habitat degradation. So, degradation is reduction of quality. And throughout the world, for a large number of habitats, we have already degraded them. The second thing we have done is habitat fragmentation. That is, we have divided the habitats into very small portions. Now, certain organisms such as tigers or elephants, they require large forests for their own sustenance. And so, if you divide the forest into smaller patches, then none of these patches will be able to support these organisms. So, this is habitat fragmentation. And third is habitat loss. That is, when you degrade and fragment the habitat to a very large extent, 
to such a situation that is now no longer able to support the organisms, then we say that there has been a situation of habitat loss. And we have already lost a large number of habitats. So, conservation is required because we have already created huge losses for forested wildlife. Now, all of these things, habitat degradation, fragmentation, loss, combined with things like hunting of animals, over extraction of fishery resources have led to a mass extinction of species. A large number of species are already gone. So, if we do not conserve what is remaining, we will be left with nothing. We have created global warming and, and climate change, which again have a large negative impact for forests and wildlife. When there is a case of global warming, then probably you can switch on an AC, but the animals out there do not have access to AC. There is also a situation that is known as the escalator to extinction. What it means is, if you have a hilly area or a mountainous area, you will find that the bottom areas have a high temperature and the upper areas have a lower temperature. So, there is a temperature gradient that is there. Now, when the temperature increases, the organisms at this location will move to this location, so that they are able to retain their habitat of a low temperature. So, as and when the temperature rises, the animals move up. So, the animal that is here will move here. The animal that is here will move here. But then what about the animal at the very top, where would this animal go? So, there is no place left for this animal and so basically the animals are moving up towards their extinction and this process is known as the escalator to extinction. So, we have already created huge losses for forests and wildlife. One of the major losses is through global warming and climate change. Climate change results in a large number of uh, events that are extreme events. So, you will have extreme droughts, you will have extreme floods. Now, humans are able to adapt to these because we have resources. So, there is, if there is an extreme drought event, then probably we will bring water from somewhere else. If there is an extreme flood event, then probably we will evacuate our people to a safe place. But what about the animals? They do not have these options. And all of these things are coming up because of climate change. So, if we do not uh, right our wrong, then probably the, the organisms will have no other option but to become extinct. So, this is another huge loss. Then we have led to ocean acidification because of an increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide, the oceans are now turning acidic, which is again leading to a great amount of habitat degradation. We have led to desertification of areas and because we have already created these huge losses, because we have wronged them, it is our job to put the situation right. So, this is again why we need conservation. And not only have we created these losses, but it is expected that the, these impacts will increase with time. So, the impact of humans is described by this equation, i is equal to p into a into t and it says that p that is the population, if population goes up, the impact will go up, because you will have more mouths to feed, more bodies to drape with clothes, more people to shelter. So, the amount of resources that is required will go up as the population goes up, which will increase the impact on the ecosystems. A is affluence, how much money do people have? Are you able to afford just a fan or are you able to afford an AC? If you ha have affluence, if you are able to afford an AC, then your consumption of electricity is bound to increase. So, the impact of humans goes up with affluence and it goes up 
with technology and we know that technology also has been going up so the population is going this is human population so the human population is going up people are becoming more affluent technology is increasing which is helping us to extract these resources and so because all three of these are increasing the impact is also increasing so if we do not do conservation it will be a lost case another point we can put up is that it is our moral legal and cultural responsibility to conserve forest and wildlife and because of these we require conservation now what is management management is the process of dealing with or controlling things or people that is it is the process of dealing with things it's a process of dealing with people it's a process of controlling things and it's a process of controlling people and management is something that we do on a day to day basis you have to manage your time you have to manage your studies you have to manage your courses you have to manage the fundings that you have you have to manage your own household you have to manage your own room you have to manage your colleagues so management is something that all of us are doing on a day to day basis and why are we doing that it is because management is important it allows us to achieve our objectives and goals so if you have an objective or a goal to get a degree you will have to manage your time and your courses so that you attain your goal of getting your degree it allows us to best utilize the resources optimally so that it keeps on going for a very long time and you get the maximum benefits why do you need to utilize the resources optimally because resources are always scarce it's a basic principle of economics that wants are unlimited but resources are limited and so these resources have to be managed so that there is an optimum utilization you get the biggest bang for your buck you get the biggest benefit with whatever cost you are putting in to achieve the maximum benefits with the lowest costs and this is there everywhere how can you study in a lesser amount of time so how do you manage your techniques in such a way that you have time left for other things as well because time is limited how do you manage your the money so that you are able to get to buy not just thing a but also things b c and d so this is why management is important it helps to establish a responsive responsible stable and sound organization so for any organization if you want it to be responsive to things that is if something goes wrong it should be able to respond in a time it should be responsible to its duties it should be stable and it should be based on sound principles if you want to establish any organization with these uh, characteristics you will need to manage that organization and to prepare for the unknown future so basically conservation is important management is important but then why is how does law come into the picture why is law important for conservation why is law important for management so before we understand that let us understand what law actually is so law is a set of rules that are created and are enforceable by social or government institutions to regulate behavior so law is a set of rules you have n number of rules and the whole combination of these rules becomes the law of the land and why do you have these rules these rules are created and they are also enforceable that is you have a punitive power to ensure that people follow or abide by these rules these powers can be because of social institutions or because of government institutions and these laws are created and they are enforced to regulate the behavior of people so this is law a set of rules that are created and are enforceable by social or government institutions to regulate behavior we can also define law as the science and art of justice justice being the quality of being fair and reasonable so if you want to have a society that is fair to everybody 
that is reasonable to everybody, you will need a set of rules and these sets, set of rules becomes the law of the land. Here are some statements about law. Now, these statements are important because law again is difficult to define. When we say these rules that are created and enforceable by social or government institutions, this definition again has certain lacuna. If there are rules that cannot be enforced, do we call it a law or not? If there are rules that are enforced by moral institutions, then is it a law or not? If there are rules that are made not to regulate behavior, but to do something else, is it a law or not? So, basically you need to understand this term law from different viewpoints and these philosophers have provided us with certain viewpoints. Aristotle said that perfect law is inherent in the nature of man or woman and can be discovered through reason. So, this is an intrinsic quality, it is inside all of us, but we only need to discover it through reasoning. It is immutable, so it does not change, it is universal. So, basically the, the principles of law can be applied everywhere and it is capable of growth because the principles of law get discovered and when they dis get discovered, the body of law increases. So, it is capable of growth, but once you have discovered it, it will not change and it will have a universal applicability. Austin said law is the command of the sovereign. So, what Austin is saying here is that the sovereign or the government, if it says something that is the law, pure and simple. You do not have to consider whether it is inherent in the nature of man, how it is to be discovered, nothing. If the sovereign says that this is law, then it is law. Dicey said law is the reflection of public opinion. So, Dicey is saying that it is not the government that makes the laws, but the public it is the public that makes the laws. Salman says law is body of principles recognized and applied by the state in the administration of justice. So, all of these are different perspectives of law. And now, if we see how conservation and management are being done in the legal setting, we just have to look at our constitution. Article 48a of the constitution of India states that the state shall endeavor to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard the forests and wildlife of the country. Now, constitution is the fundamental law of any country. It is the basic law through which all the other laws derive their power. And here, if the constitution is stating that it is a responsibility of the state, that is the government, to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard the forests and wildlife of the country, it means that this is um, the most fundamental uh, rule of the land. So, you need to do conservation in this legal setting. You need to ensure that the forests and wildlife are safeguarded. Article 51 AG of the constitution says, it shall be the duty of every citizen of India to protect and improve the natural environment, including forests, lakes, rivers and wildlife and to have compassion for living creatures. Here again, the constitution of India is emphasizing the fact that it is the duty of everyone, every citizen to, to protect and improve the natural environment and this natural environment includes forests, lakes, rivers and wildlife and you need to have compassion for living creatures. So, here we are looking at the basic law of the land and it is talking about conservation. So, conservation is not done in isolation, it is done in this legal setting. Then you have article 51 A i of the constitution of India, it shall be the duty of every citizen of India to safeguard public property and to abjure violence. Now, public property includes forests and wildlife. The Honorable Supreme Court of India in this particular case stated that Article 21 protects life, uh, right to life as a fundamental right. Enjoyment of life and its attainment, including their right to life with human dignity, encompasses within its ambit 
the protection and preservation of environment, ecological balance, free from pollution of air and water, sanitation without which life cannot be enjoyed. And any contra acts or actions would cause environmental pollution. So, basically you have article 21 of the constitution of India and it says that people have the right to life. Now, this right to life is a fundamental right. And the Supreme Court is saying that right to life cannot be there if you do not have the right to life with human dignity. You need to have a dignified life. And this dignified life encompasses within itself the protection and preservation of the environment and things like ec ecological balance. And for these, you need to have well functioning ecosystems with forests and wildlife. So, here again, the Supreme Court is saying that other fundamental rights including the right to life also have a say in the conservation matters. So, conservation and law are very closely linked together. Similarly, if you are managing anything, you are required to respect the laws of the land and the rights of the people and anything includes your daily life. So, in running your daily life, you have to follow things like laws of the road, the banking laws and so on. So, management is also very closely linked to law. So, basically conservation and management are both very closely related to law. So, from here we move to jurisprudence. Jurisprudence is the knowledge of law. So, while managing your daily lives, while conserving things, you need to have this knowledge of law. This word jurisprudence comes from Latin juris, which means law and prudentia, which means knowledge. And jurisprudence answers two questions about law. What is the nature and purpose of law? What is the nature of law and what is the purpose of law? What are the characteristics of law and why do we have law? What purpose does it serve? And the second is, what are the sources of law? How do you get the law? So, now let us look at both of these things. The nature and purpose of law. Why is there a law in the first place? Do we require laws? What would happen if we did not have any laws? Would it make any difference to our lives? So, this is what this question is asking. What is the nature and purpose of law? Now, why do we need to know about this, the nature and purpose of law? Because some laws have appeared to be blatantly wrong. So, if we go with the definition that law is the command of the sovereign, then there is a very big possibility that this command might itself be wrong. It might be morally abhorrent. It shakes you from the inside. And in that case, do you call it a law or not? laws keep on changing because laws are at times blatantly wrong. Examples include laws on racial profiling and discrimination. So, we will look at it in greater detail in, in one of the later lectures, but we have had laws for racial profiling and discrimination in this world. The whole system of apartheid in Africa was a system of racial profiling and discrimination. The system of the Nazis to discriminate against the Jews was a system of racial profiling and discrimination. And all of these were supported by laws of that time. Then we have had laws denying women the right to vote. We we'll look at certain uh, court judgments which said that you only have the right to vote if you are a man and if you have certain and certain amount of property. So, not everybody used to have the right to vote. So, and this was a law that was passed or enacted by the parliament. So, some laws are blatantly wrong and so you need to think do we need these laws in the first place. Then laws have kept changing, discrimination was outlawed, women were provided the right to vote. So, if laws have been wrong, if laws have kept on changing, then 
doesn't this raise a question that it would not have mattered much if we did not have laws in the first place at all? Because if you are making the law and if you are changing it, then what is the purpose of making this law in the first place? So, this is the question we are going to answer. And to answer this question, there are two dominant strands of thinking. One is positive law and the second is natural law. Positive law or legal positivism talks about law that exists because posit is put forward. So, this is law that has been put forward, law that exists. If there is a law that exists, then it is a law. And this law can be obliging or specifying some action. So, the theory of legal positivism says that if there is a law, then that is the end of the matter. You should not be thinking about whether this is a right law or a wrong law. You should not be thinking about do we need this law or not. So, if a law exists, if a law has been put forward, enacted, then legal positivism says that, that so be it. Now, thinkers in the field of legal positivism such as Thomas Hobbes came up with theories like the social contract theory to explain the need of these laws, even unjust laws. So, these theories explain that even if there is a law that is blatantly wrong, that is abhorrent, that shakes the moral fabric of the society, but still you need to have that law. So, this is one kind of thinking. Now, Thomas Hobbes explained it as this. He said that man is completely self-centered. So, all of us are self-centered. We want objects, we desire objects that satisfy our wants. So, all of us want to get more and more things to satisfy our desires. And the life of man is a perpetual and restless desire for power after power after power, ending only when he dies. That is because man is self-centered and is just working to satisfy his needs. So, the whole life of man is a perpetual that is continuing and restless desire for power and if he gets power he does not stop he wants another power then he wants another power till his death so this is the natural state of being and men are nearly so equal that there is no one decisively superior to any other so basically you have in a natural society that does not have any laws you have n number of people and all these people are self-centered, all of these people just want to get more and more resources for themselves to satisfy their wants and there is no ending to this desire. And if that happens, there will be a constant conflict between people because there is nobody that is decisively superior to any other. People are nearly the same and because all of them are working towards this fulfilling their desires, there will be a war, war of all against all. So, everybody will be in a conflict with everybody else. Because if person A has a resource X, then person B would also want that resource X, person C would also want that resource X and so on. So, even getting a resource will not lead to stability because everybody else would be after that resource if you do not have any laws in the country. So, every man is trying to get more power for himself. Now, if this is the state of being, if everybody is in a state of war, then this would create continual fear in the state of nature. So, everybody would be afraid. There is a continuous danger of violent death and the life of man is solitary. So, people live alone because even if you wanted to form a group, then it is possible that your group mates themselves will kill you and get your resources. So, it is best to live solitary. People will be poor because they will not be able to uh, accumulate their resources together to achieve an objective. It will be nasty, it will be brutish, it will be short. And to avoid this state of nature, free men contract with each other to establish a civil society through a social contract. So, why do we have a social contract? To avoid this situation the situation of the state of nature where there is no law. So, to avoid this state of nature, Hobbes says 
free men contract with each other to establish a civil society through a social contract and everyone agrees to hand over the right to create interpret and implement the law to a single sovereign body because if people made their own laws then everybody would make his or her own law to best uh, fulfill his or her desires and so there will be no end to the conflict so you have to agree that okay we are giving up this right to make any rules and will we all of us will give this right to create interpret and implement the rules to one body and that body is the sovereign or the king or in today's con uh, context the government and this sovereign because the sovereign is making the laws it's creating the laws so this sovereign has to be above the law and law then is the command of the sovereign so because you have created the social contract you have given the right to the sovereign so once you have given the right you cannot take it back and the sovereign is above the law and whatever the sovereign says that should be the law so this is legal positivism in today's context the sovereign can be replaced by the government the government has three wings you have the legislature that is parliament and the state assemblies that create the laws you have the judiciary that interprets the laws and you have the executive that implements the laws so here we said the right to create interpret and implement and today the government comprising of these three wings is doing the same thing now in legal positivism law is distinct from moral obligation law is backed by a threat of punishment or sanction so what legal positivism says is that because the sovereign is above the law so even if there is no moral obligation the law stands and you are going to follow what is the law of the land not because you have a moral obligation to follow the law but because the sovereign is going to threaten you with punishment or sanction if you do not follow the laws so this is required for a stable society some later thinkers have used coordination in place of conflict but essentially it remains the same thing so essentially the theory of legal positivism says that to remove the conflicts to have a nice life to have cooperation and coordination between people all of us have to uh, relinquish this right to make any rules to a certain body that body can be the sovereign or the government and once we have given this right then the sovereign or the government is going to create laws interpret the laws implement the laws and threaten everybody with a sanction or a punishment if they do not follow the law and it is only because of this threatening or sanction that the society is able to exist so this is legal positivism another way of looking at laws is natural law natural law says that there are some universal principles of justice intrinsic to human nature and therefore any man made law must adhere to it so natural law says that naturally the principles of justice are inside all of us and if any man made law is there then it should correspond to these principles of justice otherwise we'll not call it a law so basically natural law says that if there is a law that is blatantly wrong then even though it's a command of the sovereign it, even though it has been legislated in the correct manner following all the procedures then too we will not call it a law because it does not adhere to the intrinsic principles of justice that is ingrained in all of us there can be two readings of natural law the strong natural law thesis says that if a human law fails to be in response to compelling reasons then it is not a law at all it says lex injusta lex is law injusta so it means unjust law non est lex non is no est is is lex is law so an unjust law is not law so you can directly say that it's not a law we are not going to follow it then there is a weak natural law thesis 
that says that if, it, if human laws fail to be in response to compelling reasons, then it must be recognized as a defective law, but then this defective law has to be changed again by the sovereign or by the government. So, people should not say that it is a defective law, so we are not going to follow it. Even if it is an unjust law, let us recognize it as an unjust law and let us change it following the procedures. So, that is the weak theory. The strong theory says that if it is unjust, just do not follow it, it is not a law. So, we will look at an, an example from the Indian Salt Act of 1882. Now, section 3 of the Indian Salt Act said that manufacture of salt includes the separation of salt from earth or other substances, so as to produce elementary salt. Elementary salt is the salt that we eat daily, so it is the dietary salt. So, manufacture of salt includes the separation of salt from earth or other substance. So, basically if you are mining uh, your table salt from the earth or you are separating the table salt from sea water, then it comes under this category of manufacture of salt. And the excavation or removal of natural saline deposits or efflorescence. So, all of these are known as the manufacture of salt. Now, salt is a basic item of our diets, salt that is sodium chloride, it is required for your functioning, because your body has so many sodium and chloride channels. It is required to maintain the electrolyte balance of your body. When a person gets diarrhea, then that person has to be administered ORS, which is oral rehydration solution, which is water with salt and sugar. So, salt is such a basic thing, but there is a law that was enacted to control this. So, this law said that no, you do not have rights to the salt, only we have the rights to this salt. So, it said that all of these processes are the manufacture of salt and the governor general in council may from time to time by rule prohibit absolutely or subject to such conditions as he thinks fit the manufacture of salt. So, the governor general in council can prohibit absolutely the manufacture of salt. So, the governor general in council can say that in India there will be no manufacturing of salt whatsoever. If that is done, what will people eat? The governor general in council can fix fee for licenses. So, it can give licenses to manufacture salt and it can take a fees for that license. Now, salt is a very inexpensive product, but during the times of British India, it was there was such a huge amount of fees that it became very expensive product and this expensive product was created through this law and they can also regulate the collection of duties or regulate the position of salt. So, if you have salt with you, then you need to have certain paperwork to show where you got the salt from whether you have paid the duties or not. Then as we saw there is a threat of punishment. So, you have section 9 and 10 which says penalty for first conviction is 500 rupees and or imprisonment up to 6 months. So, even if you are taking salt from sea water to eat, even if you are just taking it from the sea coast, you will be imprisoned up to 6 months and you will have to pay this fine of 500 rupees and this is 500 rupees of the year 1882. Penalty for second and subsequent convictions, imprisonment up to 6 months plus punishment liable under previous offence. That is, if you take salt the second time, you will be punished for one year, 6 months plus 6 months plus 500 rupees. If you take salt for the third time, you will be imprisoned for one and a half years plus 500 rupees. Then it talks about confiscation of salt, vessels, packages, coverings, animals and conveyances used in carrying it. So, if you are transporting salt in a bullock cart, then the bullock will be confiscated, the cart will be confiscated, the packages in which you are carrying the salt will be confiscated and the salt will be confiscated. Then you have power to levy additional duty as penalty, power to search places where article is manufactured power to detain suspected person and to seize goods liable to confiscation, all of these done for what? Just for 
your normal table salt. You have the power to arrest, power to enter and search any house, boat or place in which there is reason to believe that salt is being manufactured, refined or stored. And in case of resistance to break open any door, force and remove any obstacle to such entry. So, the government has been given such huge powers, they can enter any place, they can break any door, if they have a reason to believe that salt is being manufactured, refined or stored. Power to prohibit import and transit of salt. So, because of all of these grotesque provisions, in 1930 we had the Dandi March and the Dharasana Satyagraha. Now, Dandi March was done to a place called Dandi, where the salt was taken up on the sea coast and Gandhiji said that I am breaking the salt law because it is an unjust law. We just saw before, in the case of natural law reading, you can have two things. In the strong thesis, you can say that if a law is unjust, then it is not a law at all. And so, Gandhiji said that because this is such an unjust law, I do not consider it to be a law and so I am going to break it. And everybody should break it because it is an unjust law and so there should be this message to the government. So, we had the Dandi March, we had the Dharasana Satyagraha. Now, in the case of the Dharasana, uh, Dharasana Satyagraha, people were beaten even to their deaths for salt. So, as reported by Webb Miller, Suddenly, at a word of command, scores of native police rushed upon the advancing marchers. So, people were marching to these Dharasana salt works. So, at the command, the police rushed to the marchers and started beating them. They rained blows on their heads with their steel shod lattes. Not one of the marchers even raised an arm to fend off the blows. So, because Basically, this was a non-violent struggle, so the people did not resist. They went down like 10 pins. From where I stood, I heard the sickening wax of the clubs on unprotected skulls. So, the skulls are getting fractured. In 2 or 3 minutes, the ground was quilted with bodies. When everyone of the first column had been knocked down, stretcher bearers rushed up unmolested by the police and carried off the injured to a thatched hut, which had been arranged as a temporary hospital. Then another column formed, while the leaders pleaded with them to retain their self-control. So, this is a non-violent struggle, where people are just marching to the salt works and the police is fracturing their skulls with lattes. They marched slowly towards the police. I counted 320 injured many still insensible with fractured skulls, others writhing with in agony from kicks in the testicles and stomach. The Gandhi men had been able to gather only a few native doctors, so we did not have a large number of Indian doctors, who were doing the best they could with the inadequate facilities. Scores of the injured had received no treatment for hours and two had died. Now, because of all of these protests, in 1946, that is 16 years after the Dandi March, Sir Archibald Rawlins formally issued an order abolishing the salt tax. But then this order was vetoed by the Viceroy, Lord Wevel. So, this is the level of injustice that we can see here. And it was only in 1947 that the salt tax was abolished by the interim government of India. So, this is the reading of natural law. It says that if a law is unjust, you have to resist it, you should not consider it to be a law, you should get it repealed. But then natural law also has its own limitations. Moral judgments are not verifiable. You One person might think that it is unjust, another can say that no, it is a just law, what is the problem in it? For example, death penalty for murder, is it right or not? There is a lack of precision and clarity that often makes natural law nearly a, a moral convention. In the absence of coercive power, adherence is often ineffective. Now, positive law talked about uh, ad adherence through the threat of punishment. 
but natural law says that because these principles of justice are ingrained in all of us so people will naturally follow them but that is not often the case adherence is often ineffective depending on individual conscience and social pressure so the influence of natural law is more pronounced in international law and less in criminal and civil law so that is the nature of law let us now look at the sources of law where do you get the laws from so you can get laws from legislations laws made deliberately in a set form by an authority which the courts have accepted as competent to use that function in our case it's the parliament and the state legislatures another source of law is the precedent that is rules derived from decision or reasoning in similar situations in the past so basically the courts look at the laws that are made by the parliament or the legislatures or they look at precedents what have the previous courts decided in this case we can define statute as a written law that is passed by a legislature and precedent is based on this doctrine of stare decisis it means that the courts should stand by the decided cases and not disturb established practices so if there is a, a particular case that has happened in the past and the courts have given a certain judgment a certain ruling a certain interpretation then that judgment ruling or interpretation is going to be followed unless otherwise indicated so the courts should stand by the their decided cases and not disturb the established practices this rule has been self imposed by the courts in the interest of certainty predictability and maintaining their own authority now there are certain essential ingredients of precedent the hierarchy of the court the precedent from a decision of a higher court is a binding precedent for lower courts that is if the supreme court decides something then it has to be followed throughout india if the high court decides something it has to be followed throughout that state all the lower courts are going to follow that precedent from a decision of a lower court only has a persuasive force in higher courts that is the higher courts can accept or not accept the ruling but it has a persuasive force because you can always argue that such and such judge or such and such number of judges have already arrived at the same interpretation so it must be the correct interpretation please follow it but the higher courts can always reject that so hierarchy of the courts is important the second thing is ratio decidendi a binding precedent must establish a principle of law that is essential for decision it should be an essential part of the decision and not by the way or incidental to the actual decision or obiter dicta that is it should comprise the core of the decision only then shall it be used as a precedent if a judge says something just by the way in the judgment then it will not be considered to be a precedent it should be applicable to the present case a binding precedent must establish a principle of law that is relevant to the facts of the present case or applicable to the present case if the present case is very much different from the previous case then you can argue that this precedent is not binding because it is not applicable to the situation at hand so it has to be applicable the conditions should be similar distinguishing the facts of the present case from the pre from the precedent case is often a standard way of avoiding being bound by a precedent so if the lawyer wants not to follow the precedent then he or she can always argue that the present case is very different from the previous precedent case and so this precedent is not applicable to the case at hand then the precedent must also be valid by valid it means that it must not have been repealed or altered either by a statute or by a higher court with the power to overrule the decision so if all four of these things happen then we will say that this is a precedent that is to be followed in the decision so in this lecture we have looked at what is conservation what is management 
what is law what is jurisprudence why do we need law we looked at the positive theory of law that is legal positivism we looked at natural laws and then we looked at the sources of laws that is it can be through a statute or because of a precedent so this is a basic introduction to law and in throughout this course we are going to come back to these concepts to understand what kinds of laws are there in our country how are they to be implemented for management and for conservation so let us have a look at the various topics that we are going to cover in this course the first module that we have started today is the general principles of law so here we'll talk about things like rights and duties crimes and civil wrongs then in the second module we'll look at classification of law how do you classify law into different categories what is the rule of law that is if a law gets made then is it a correct law or not are there any conditions that bind the legislature when they are framing a law that is the rule of law then we look at natural justice that provides fairness in uh, the procedures then we look at justice delivery that is the structure of courts in our country administrative law and tribunals alternate dispute redressal mechanisms such as arbitration conciliation and mediation then we look at crime and punishment the concept of crime what is a crime what are the theories of punishment what are the legal remedies that are available in civil cases then we'll look at the ipc or the indian penal code in detail we'll have the introduction general exceptions and punishments under the ipc then we'll take a short break of some special topics that is interpretation of statutes if something is written how do you interpret it the law of torts the prevention of cruelty to animals act then we'll move into procedural law that is the criminal procedure code what is the procedure in criminal cases how do you classify offenses what is arrest what is bail what are the procedures for that how do you perform a search how do you seize things what are the reformative and compensation provisions in crpc and then other provisions then we'll devote three lectures to the indian evidence act what is a correct evidence what is a valid evidence then we'll look at conservation laws of the country we'll look at the indian forest act the forest conservation act the wildlife protection act the forest rights act the environment protection act the air act and the water act and these 12 modules will be followed up with summing up and discussion so this is basically an outline of this course so i welcome you again to this course that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind